there's this situation that he's describing to these people about Jesus is going to return, and everything hasn't just been like, the, like those who mock, like those who uh, laugh at, like those who make fun of, those who are believing and waiting for Jesus to come back. He's saying there's going to be mockers that are going to come, and they're going to say things like, everything's always continued the same. He's not coming back. Everything's been this way from the beginning, and it's going to continue to be this way. And he says it escapes your notice that everything hasn't always been the same. And I know we've, we've talked about this some in the past and, and not going to go into all that detail again of that portion. But he says in verse 8, But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Interestingly enough, a lot of times if somebody says, the patience of, you would respond, Job. And that's because the New Testament says that about Job, right? And it's interesting when we go back and we, we look at Job and we see some of Job's responses He maintained faith in God through everything that happened to him. And I think I may have just even said this recently, but I'm going to say it again. But he asked lots of questions. He talked to God. He, he wanted to know, why is this happening? Why is this taking place? What is it that I've missed? What is it that I don't understand? What is it that, that you are trying to get across to me? I mean, all kinds of questions that are coming. Haven't I been faithful to you? And so Job asked lots of questions, and we might, we might take that as, well, that's not very patient. But he was patient in his waiting on God to give the answers. He was patient in having faith that God was going to deliver him regardless. And we're looking at some of that today, but I wonder sometimes, because... We hear that over and, and over again. I mean, the, the patience of Job. I mean, everybody kind of knew what that response was going to be. What about the patience of God? When you consider I was really going to say the world right there. But when I consider me, and the patience that God has with me, he's really patient. How about you? And then you combine that all together, and then maybe we can save the world. I mean, we don't like a lot of what we see around us, and we, we are uncomfortable with things that happen in the world. And, and I mean, it's so very interesting. You can, you, can, you can look at it now, and you can read things that, that people write or that people say and things that happen, and you can go back 30 years ago, and you can read some of the same things and see the responses of people, and you can go back 100 years ago, and you can see the same thing. All of this time, even to the point that, that God came down and wrestled with Jacob and made a point that he put up with preserving a people that he had promised Abraham that he would preserve to the point that he was going to bring Jesus into the world through Abraham's seed. And he put up with everything he put up with. As you just read through the Old Testament, and you, you see what these people did, and it would have just been so easy to say, that's, that's it, that's enough. And as a matter of fact, he did. 
And Moses said, no, please, no. Give him another chance, and he did. He isn't slow about his promise, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. His patience is for us. His patience is for those people that we have yet to tell about Jesus Christ. That's what his patience is for, wishing for all to come to repentance. So God's waiting. I put a a title on the lesson this morning, Wait. If we glance through the scriptures, and I've got a few that I would like for us to to look at today. One that that probably a lot of people are familiar with is Psalm 27. So if you want to be turning to there, I I want us to look together at what is said there. One of those that that is frequently read. And and I really am going to keep from jumping to the end of this psalm and and begin in the first. I mean, there's some some amazing things in these psalms, and sometimes uh, we just want to make a point, and and we'll look at, at... Maybe one verse or two verses when uh, this, this is written as a poem. This is a song. And so let's read this, Psalm 27. Verse 1, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? When evildoers came upon me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and my enemies, they stumbled and fell. Though a host encamp against me, my heart will not fear. The war rise against me. In spite of this, I shall be confident. One thing I have asked from the Lord that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will conceal me in his tabernacle. In the secret place of his tent, he will hide me. He will lift me up on a rock. And now my head will be lifted up above my enemies around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy, and will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, and be gracious to me and answer me. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, O Lord, I shall seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not abandon me nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me up. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in the level path because of my foes. Do not deliver me over to the desires of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and such as breathe out violence. I would have despaired unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I would have despaired unless I had believed. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. We have entered into what what we are calling thy will in this year thy will discovery what we are in the midst of right now is a time of prayer how many of you been praying about it okay good let's get to a point where everybody is raising your hand and that we we are journaling the things not only that we're praying about that but when, when something is upon our heart or comes to our minds that we journal those things down as they relate to the prayers that we're praying to God. It's going to be extremely difficult as we pray and as, as we come to realizations about God himself, as, as we spend this extra time devoted to prayer, and knowing that each one of us are doing that, we're, we're collectively praying to him. And it may not all be the same thing. It may not be the same details. 
Some of them may be extremely general. Some of them may be for, for specific things already. But as we do this and we recognize that we are addressing God together, seeking Him, seeking His direction, that we're going to have things that, that are, are going to come to our minds, things that are going to be up on our hearts, and we're going to think, we've got to do this. We've got to do this. I, we've got to do this right now. As though it depends on us. And it is going to be extremely hard to wait. But I want us to see that there is principle within Scripture that there are times that we simply wait on God. That is one of the things that this leadership is asking of this body of believers right here and right now is that as we have entered into this time of prayer, that we recognize it's also time to wait. Let's look at a few more passages of Scripture. Since we're in Psalms, turn over to Psalm 40. If you haven't closed out of Psalms yet. Psalm 40. starts out this by saying I waited patiently for the Lord and he inclined to me and heard my cry I waited patiently for the Lord and he inclined to me and heard my cry as much as he has already said in a psalm that if we wait on the Lord he will give us strength he will strengthen our hearts and so as we as we come to convictions and convictions that we are going to get to share with one another. He's going to strengthen us even to be able to wait. But as the psalmist puts it here, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He brought me up out of the pit of destruction, out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon a rock, making my footsteps firm. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and will trust in the Lord. He put a new song. It's something that, that is a renewal that can happen within us when we wait on God. When we wait patiently for him to bring answers. Isaiah talked about this in Isaiah 26. as we look back at, at uh, some prophecy that was coming forth and just simply even praise about God as Isaiah. You know, prophecy wasn't always just foretelling what was going to happen, but recognition of, of the life of the people in some cases, recognition of God and his attitude toward the people or his response toward the people, and even, even the promises that were there. But in, in Isaiah chapter 26, in verse 8 it says, Indeed, while following the way of your judgments, O Lord, we have waited for you eagerly. Your name, even your memory, is the desire of our souls. Also in Isaiah 40, in verse 31, it says, Yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary for those who wait for the Lord. I mean, we have all kinds of scripture that we could turn to on this, and I'm not, I'm not even going to try to, to cover all of those. One of the things that we find ourselves waiting for and that we, we recognize is simply a part of us living in Christ, in these times, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, as Paul's beginning this letter, he says something, and we'll just start in verse 4. He says, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given you in Christ Jesus, that in everything you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony concerning Christ was confirmed in you. You know, it's interesting when you read those verses, and we're not 
quite done yet, but when you read those verses, it's, it's very hard to see the people that he talks about in the rest of the letter. I mean, the, the things that they were doing, the, the, the division that was among them, the, the, the sin that was there, the jealousy, the strife, all these things that were going on that he's having to correct them in. I mean, the, the, the sin that they weren't taking care of that was among them. That he's saying, you need to take care of this. You need to address this. It doesn't, it doesn't really sound like the same people, but Paul's seeing them through the eyes of the blood of Christ. So let's read that again. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given you in Christ Jesus. The grace of God which was given you in Christ Jesus. That in everything you were enriched in him, in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony concerning Christ was confirmed in you. Then verse 7, so that you're not lacking in any gift, awaiting e eagerly the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that what we're waiting for? What if before we walk out of here today, he comes? How would you feel? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> come, Lord Jesus, come, right? Come on. But now I want to ask you one more question with that. Is there somebody that you wish you would have said something to? So if he doesn't come before we walk out of here today, what have you got to do? You see, waiting on God, I mean, if we're waiting eagerly for him to come, I mean, waiting doesn't mean doing nothing. I want us to look into the New Testament with this. That those who are waiting on God are actively waiting. As much as I hope we're going to be able to see this, I want us to make an application to us. I encourage you, when you have the time, and if you didn't take one of those sheets home with you, I know there was a few left in pews here and there and that type of thing, there's still some sheets in the back, that we read this from time to time to recognize, to help remind us, that is, of, of what we're doing together as a body. And while there is no intent to change anything major, it doesn't mean that things aren't going to change because as, as hopefully we recognized in that and recognized in presenting to the body here is that things always change. We live in a physical world and things are going to change, whether they change around us or whether they change among us. But during this time, we're devoting ourselves to wait to seek God and his direction. And so as we do that together, let's recognize that God himself does that. What is, if you were to think of the greatest thing that God ever did on this earth, the greatest thing that he ever did on this earth, what would it be? Jesus? I mean, without a doubt, right? Anybody want to get any more specific than that? He forgave you. And that's Jesus, right? What's that? Showered us with his mercies. All those things having to do with Jesus, right? What if Jesus hadn't risen from the dead? Paul said we're of all men most to be pitied, right? I mean, he died on the cross. That took care of our sin. He did that. But if he didn't come out of that grave, he wasn't who he said he was. If he didn't come out of that grave, he was a liar. The firstborn from the dead. Just, maybe, maybe it's just in my estimation, the greatest thing that God ever... He was declared with power to be the Son of God, according to Romans chapter 1 by his resurrection he 
came forth. He could not be, be held in its power. Think about the apostles at that point. Or maybe broader than that. Think about all the disciples at that point. When they saw Jesus, what, what were they like? What was their response? And they were excited. I mean, they fell down. They, they, they did all kinds of things. I mean, he told Mary, stop clinging to me. I haven't yet ascended to the Father. I mean, there, there was, he, he had to show Thomas his, his, his hands and his feet. And by that time, Thomas was like, almost like, I don't have to see it now. I'm okay. I can't imagine the excitement of seeing Jesus for the first time after you had seen him dead. After you knew he was dead, and now you've seen him walking and talking or eating fish or whatever it was that he was doing in those occasions where the disciples were with him. And what they want to know? Now what are you going to do? Now what are we going to do? Right? Turn to Luke chapter 24. We'll look at a couple passages on this. In verse... 44, after they'd given Jesus a piece of fish. It says, Now he said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day. And that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending you forth, sending forth the promise of my Father upon you, but you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. You hear what Jesus is telling them to do? Wait. They've got to be chomping at the bits. I mean, they don't, they, they're not expecting him to leave again. But he's telling him, all the things must be fulfilled that are written about me. And he opened their minds to understand this, and he says it's, it's supposed to begin from Jerusalem, so I'm telling you, wait. Now turn to Acts chapter 1. I mean, it's even, it's even clearer. Keep in mind the pouring forth of the Holy Spirit that Joel had prophesied about, that Jesus had talked about, had not happened yet. For some 40 days, Jesus has, had presented himself to the apostles, to other, others, even 500 brethren at one time. Jesus was seen. And Paul, Paul records that later on. As Luke is writing this down, I'm just going to begin in verse 1 because he's, he's recording this for this fellow named Theophilus. He says in verse 1, the first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up to heaven after he, by the Holy Spirit, had given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. To these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem but to wait for what the Father had promised. So he gathered them together and he said, now don't leave Jerusalem. 
they don't quite get all of this yet. They don't quite understand all of this. Um, because then he, he follows this up. He says, which he said, you heard of from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you're restoring the kingdom to Israel? I mean, is it now? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or epochs which the Father has fixed for his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. And after he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on and a cloud received him out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky, you get this picture? I don't know if we have all the conversation or not. It doesn't say. It tells us what we need to know about this conversation. But they're talking to Jesus about restoring Israel, and they're, they're thinking the kingdom, and they're, they're thinking Jesus is going to now just, I mean, all kingdoms are going to be destroyed, and he's, his kingdom is the one that's going to be standing. And that's what they're longing to be a part of. They're thinking everything pretty much physical at this point jesus says that's not for you to know but you will know just wait the biggest thing that god can do on the earth and then he tells them to wait in 10 days they did find out something but you know what they did in between time they, they went into an upper room, and they started praying. That's exactly right. They started praying. And they started thinking about it. And they actually did something. They made a decision, and they, but they were giving it to God. I mean, some 120 other than the 12, probably, or the 11, and, and that not counting everybody. But Peter says, there were 12 of us. Jesus sent out 12. We need to pick somebody else, and they all agree it needs to be somebody who was with us from the beginning, who has seen all of this. And so they choose these two guys, I mean, as they're talking with one another, and it says they cast lots. They do something that, that will um, come up to show them as they're praying to God about this, and they choose Matthias, that he's going to be the replacement. He's going to be the apostle, that there will now, now be 12. Now, there's all kinds of things, uh, directions we can go with that because we know, we know that Paul was sent to the Gentiles as an apostle. I mean, even we have it in plenty of scripture. We also have Barnabas being called an apostle, but an apostle to the church. I mean, one who is sent is an apostle. Um, but Paul declares even in his own writings that he is the apostle of Christ. You can say, well, we don't see that much out of Matthias. You know, after that point, was he really an apostle? Or did they just make a decision and God didn't bless that decision or, you know, and, and all of that? And that's really, I mean, we can get lost in that kind of discussion sometimes. But we see that they were active in trying to make sure that things were fulfilled to some degree. That these 12 were going to be represented. And you know what? When the Holy Spirit came upon them and we see it in Acts chapter 2, it said Peter stood up with the 11 others and so he was counted among them and we also don't see a lot of things that or we don't see anything out of some of the other apostles as well like Andrew we have no idea what else Andrew ever did it doesn't mean he wasn't active in taking the gospel to the world it's not recorded for us here but these men as they waited did not just sit around and twiddle their thumbs. And so it's not a time that, that we would say it all as we recognize this time of waiting, but that we also recognize that as we go through this process, that we have three months that we're praying together, that we're journaling together, that we have three months in which we are 
um, listening to each other with the things that, that we have been directed in over the first three months. When we have three months of then of looking at the evaluations and comparing them to the things that we've listened with each other, and then as we complete the year with three months of saying, we're going to go this direction because this is where God has led us. That we recognize that it is a biblical principle to wait. To let God lead. And that we even recognize, even as much as, I mean, these people, there were, there were things that they didn't understand. There were things that they didn't get. And they wanted to know, and Jesus said, it's not for you to know that, but you will later on. Right now, it's not for us to know. And so we wait. You guys want to come up here? You know, part of what we read in the psalm was the one who was waiting for God said that he was lifted up out of the mire and set on a solid rock. It's very easy for us to look at what we're doing as a body and to somehow remove ourselves individually from it and just look at it as what we're doing as a body. But individually, are we as well seeking God's direction for us? Seeking what God would have us to be doing. Seeking what God would have us to to begin using in our life that he has blessed us with instead of taking as the parable of the talents teaches what God has given and burying it in the earth and then expecting to just give that back to him in return rather than giving something that he has allowed to be fruitful within our lives as we use it for him there may be things that God has blessed you with beyond measure that you're hiding in the earth. Maybe it's your ability that you're using in an earthly way. And you're good at it. But you haven't given it to God at all. And so as we seek this direction, as we pray, as we do this collectively, hopefully we're doing it for ourselves individually as well. Let's pray together. Father, we do seek you. Father, we seek your guidance. Father, we know that as we lift our minds together, that individually as we stand before you, we know that without the blood of Jesus, your son, that we would be standing or sitting here before you unclean. We know that we would not be able to stand. We know that we would have to be rejected because of your holiness. And Father, we are so very sorry. Father, we pray for your forgiveness. Father, we pray that you will see the blood of Jesus before you see anything that would resemble even righteousness within our lives that would simply be as a filthy rag as you yourself has described our righteousness compared to you. Father, we're not trying to, to beat ourselves up, but just recognize what you have really done for us. Father, I love it that we can respond. What is the greatest thing that you have done on this earth? And it's, you have forgiven me. Father, thank you for every soul that is here. 
that is willing to yield to you. And we know through that that you will do great things, more than we ask, more than we imagine. And so, Father, we ask and we imagine. And, Father, we're, we're waiting to see what the more is, looking to you. Father, we hope that there are those who will be brought to you just simply in the recognition, Father, that there are others that are just simply seeking you, recognizing our faults, recognizing our shortcomings, recognizing our sin, knowing that we are only saved through your grace, through your mercy. Father, for those who can see that, that have not accepted it yet, we pray for them right now, this moment. Father, that they will receive it, that they will accept that, that they too will join us in seeking your direction for us as individuals and for us as, for us as a body. So, Father, we offer an invitation. If there be even one soul here today that needs to do that. And it's in Jesus' name that we say these words, that we pray this prayer. Amen. If you need to come today, come as we stand and sing.